um, just a few logistical items. Um, so um, please, any questions or comments, use the chat. I'll be monitoring that. Um, unless there are major clarifying questions for Alex, we'll save questions till the end. Um, but I will, I'll call on you. And so feel free to unmute yourself when you, when you do ask a question. Um, until then, please do um, keep your microphone muted so we don't have any distracting noises. You might also, um, once Alex gets started, wanna um, turn your camera off to um, make sure that things go speedily. Those of us um, on the down east coast of Maine definitely have internet challenges. Um, and then when we all come back together, feel free to turn your camera on. Um, so again, any questions? Use the chat and we'll, um, Alex is gonna talk for about 30 minutes or so and we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Um, and before we, I introduce Alex, um, Nick Fizzichelli, our president and CEO here at Scudic Institute would like to say a few words of welcome. Great, thanks Catherine and, and hello everybody. Wonderful to see so many familiar faces, Sandy and Chet and, and many others. Uh, thanks for being here. And, and as Catherine said, it's the kickoff to our uh, seventh annual Acadia Winter Festival. Um, again, Nick Fizzichelli, the president and CEO with Scudic Institute at Acadia National Park. We're a nonprofit partner of the National Park Service and Center for Inspiring Science, Learning and Community in a Rapidly Changing World. Uh, with our NPS partners, we co-lead the Research Learning Center here in Acadia National Park, including our wonderful campus uh, at Scudic Point, which sometimes even has some snow. The, my background isn't from, from today, but uh, we do have at least a little bit of snow on, on the ground. Uh, and we work with Acadia and local communities and parks across the region and across the national park system uh, on scientific research, on telling the stories of science and, and scientists in parks and, uh, and in engaging learners uh, of all ages in science for parks, people, and the planet. And I always look forward to the Acadia Winter Festival and, and what the wintry conditions will be like. You never know from year to year what we will have during Acadia Winter Festival. And I think we'll hear from Alex on, on, especially on recent trends in winter. Um, and, and I think a challenge of climate change is that, that winters are, are changing the fastest of any season, especially for those of us that, that love the winter um, for our own personal reasons like recreation. Uh, I certainly love uh, cross country skiing. I would say it's my favorite thing in the whole world to do. Um, and and it's, there's certainly seem to be less opportunities to do that. Uh, we were part of a, a study a few years ago, found that, that half of national parks across the, the national park system are already showing extreme early spring onset, meaning that winter is ending early, ending earlier than it has at any time in, in the past uh, over the, the historical record going back to, to 1901. So we know these patterns are happening here in the Northeast and the people hear that today and they're unfortunately happening uh, across uh, uh, the park system and, and, and across uh, North America. Um, but we will continue to celebrate winter and the winters that we have. And I hope you are able to get out and enjoy the winter and, and parts of our festival. So thanks for joining us tonight. And I'll hand it back over to Catherine. Thanks, Nick. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Contasta. Um, I invited Alex to speak because I knew of her work um, from producing the Maine's Climate Future Reports. And this is a series of reports that started in 2009. It's the statewide uh, assessment of climate in the state of Maine led by the University of Maine. And we um, just worked, we just published the 2020, which is the third update about a year ago uh, this month. And and that features a whole section on the fact that winter is the fastest changing season and a lot of the work that Alex has done. And so thinking of that, um, I wanted to hear a lot more from her. So I'm so glad that she could join us. Um, she is a research assistant professor at the University of New Hampshire's Earth Systems Research Center. She studies winter ecology, obviously, um, and the winter to spring transition specifically, especially the ways in which, in which climate change impacts landscapes during these um, 
sort of transition periods of seasons. She looks at interaction between land use and climate. Um, she's studied car uh, carbon sequestration, greenhouse gas emissions from ecosystems under a variety of land uses and management regimes. Dr. Contasta uses a combination of innovative field and lab experiments, state-of-the-art environmental sensors, and data integration to pursue her research agenda. Um, so welcome, Alex. Thank you. I had to find my unmute button. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm just going to dive right in and um, tell you a little bit about my first, um, when I first fell in love with winter, if I can get my slides to advance. Ah, here we go. Okay, so this is me. Um, this is in Grafton, Vermont, around 2005. I was trying to learn how to skate ski, and that's pretty much how it went um, for a long time. I grew up in Philadelphia and um, we have winter there, but uh, it snows occasionally. Then the snow gets really brown and dirty. Um, it's not the same as it is in New England. And I moved to New England in 2000, first for work and then stayed for graduate school. And it was just amazing to me how beautiful the woods were and the snow and how much you could play outside in the winter. That wasn't something that I grew up doing. Um, and I was hooked and I've been um, having fun during winter and also trying to um, you know, connect my research to winter ever since then. Catherine told you a little bit about me and I'm just gonna introduce myself again. So I um, do a lot of work trying to um, understand winter ecology because a lot of what we understand about our ecosystems is based on um, research that happens during the growing season. And a lot of important things happen during winter that we don't understand. And winters are changing really fast. I'm also interested in phenology and changing seasons and climate change. Um, Catherine talked about how I do a lot of work with sensors. Um, I spend a lot of time working with teachers and trying to um, bring my research into classrooms. A lot of work talking to, um, to community members, to policymakers. And I'm also a mom, and that has definitely um, changed the way I think about my work and put a different um, lens on it. So this is me with my younger son, um, maybe six years ago or so. So he's a lot older now, but we're out for a snowshoe, just enjoying a beautiful winter day. Okay, so let's dive right into it. Um, Earth's temperature is heating up. And this is actually a pretty cool visualization of how this works. Maybe some of you have seen this before, I don't know. This is from NASA and you can watch changes in Earth's temperature, how much it's warmed um, against the historical background starting in 1880 and this goes up to 2018. And what you're looking for are areas um, that are blue or a little bit cooler than the historical average and areas that are yellow or red are getting warmer than the historical average. And you can sort of watch this move forward in time. I shared this link with Catherine and so she can hopefully put it in the chat. Um, but as you sort of watch this simulation move forward in time, you see more and more red coming up in the, um, in the map. And so we know that the earth is getting warmer. And we also know that it's extremely likely that human activities, especially emissions of greenhouse gases are the dominant cause of this warming, especially since the mid 20th century. So this is a quote from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that um, studies the, the human causes and consequences of, of um, our changing climate. We know that um, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide are increasing in the atmosphere and they're increasing really fast. Um, they're showing big changes just over a few generations. And so this is a figure of um, what's known as the Keeling curve. It was um, started by Charles David Keeling. Um, it's uh, uh, observations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that go back to 1958. Um, and I've shown some key periods here just to emphasize how much this has changed over the course of a couple of generations of my own family. So here at the start of the record, um, 
Can you see my mouse moving around? Yes. Okay. So here at the start of the record, this is my grandmother and my uncle. This is 1958. And they're on a sled in Ohio in the town where my dad grew up and CO2 concentrations are 316 parts per million. We fast forward in time about 20 years to 1976. This is the year I was born. Um, I don't have any cute baby pictures of myself. I realized they were all in my dad's basement, so I need to fix that. But I was a bicentennial baby born in Philadelphia. And the year that I was born, CO2 concentrations were 330 ppm. So they had gone up about 15 parts per million. Move forward in time again, we're in the early 2000s. I moved to New England. I'm trying to learn how to ski, falling in love with winter. And CO2 concentrations have increased again. And now we're at 369 parts per million. And in 2020, here's me and my son walking up the hill next to our house in the snow. Um, CO2 concentrations are now 415 parts per million. So we go from my grandmother to me and we've increased CO2 concentrations by 100 ppm, right? So they're, they're increasing and they're increasing pretty fast. Okay, so we know that um, our climate is warming and we know that this is caused by emissions of greenhouse gases, but I'm really interested in winter. And so this um, figure is showing how winter has changed in the past, um, really looking at it since 1970. Again, areas that you see in red are warming more quickly than areas that you see in yellow. I think something that's interesting to show here is that there aren't any areas that are blue, right? Nowhere is getting cooler in the winter. Everywhere on this figure is getting warmer, especially the upper Midwest and the Northeast. We're seeing a lot of winter warming in our region of the world. And Nick mentioned this in the beginning um, during his welcoming remarks, winter temperatures are warming faster than summer temperatures. So we're seeing a lot of winter warming and um, that winter warming is happening a lot faster than increases in temperature we're seeing during the summer. So here's just showing um, increases in annual temperature on the top um, uh, over, a historical um, baseline, the first part of the 20th century. This is showing what the warming has been over recent decades. And you see a lot of red, right? But if you break that out by season, you look at summer temperatures, yes, you see warming, but it's nothing compared to the warming that you see in winter. You see way more red on this map if you're looking at winter temperatures. So winters are warming and they're warming faster than the summer. And this matters. Um, there are lots of reasons why um, loss of winter conditions and changing winters matter. So this can impact things like outdoor recreation. So um, the ability to go out and ski, you know, it can cut into our fun time, but this is actually a really big deal for um, communities that rely on outdoor recreation for tourism, right? So it really impacts rural and mountain economies strongly. It has impacts for water quality um, it has impacts for public health. So cold temperatures can keep insects that we don't want away from us, right? So um, as winter is warm, it can expand the range for ticks, for invasive mosquitoes. Um, it has impacts on wildlife, so it disrupts wildlife habitat. Um, and it also, um, you know, for example, snowshoe hair is white, right? It always turns white and it turns white even if there's no snow, right? So there can be problems for wildlife um, and their habitat with loss of winter cold and snow. Um, there can be declining conditions that are suitable for winter logging. It's hard to access sites if they're not um, snow covered or don't have frozen roads because they can cause a lot of, um, of uh, impacts to sites that, that um, don't allow for extraction of wood. It can expand the range for damaging invasive forest pests. So not just insects that are harmful to us, but insects that are harmful to trees. And then it also really um, is important for um, our sense of place and our cultural traditions. And so the loss of winter really matters in a lot of different dimensions. And this was one of the reasons why um, uh, some colleagues and I wrote a paper 
It came out in 2019, really trying to understand how winters across the northern forest region of North America, so that's shown in green, um, how those conditions have changed and, and how they've changed in ways that are important for people and for ecosystems. Because we know the conditions are getting warmer, we know that we're losing snow, but we're um, losing conditions in specific ways that are important for, um, for forests and are important for people. Um, and so to do this analysis, we broke up the region into three areas, the east where we are, the central and the west, and we used climate data from weather stations. So we use um, weather station data from Canada because some of our region is in Canada and also from the United States. And these are measurements that people have been taking, right? So volunteer observers going out and measuring temperature, precipitation, snow depth, and snowfall. And our record went back for a hundred years. So we're looking at a really long time period. And actually I was telling um, uh, Nick and Catherine before we got on, we wrote some of this paper at the Skudik Institute. So our co-authors, um, my co-authors and I spent some time at the Skudik Institute writing this paper together. So I have a, a connection to the place just, um, just from that great experience. And so I'm going to share just a few of our findings. Um, we do have a report um, that uh, summarizes a lot of this, and I sent Catherine the link so you can go and download that report, and it has a lot of our findings in it. But again, we um, developed this um, suite of indicators of how winters are changing. So we didn't just look at things like how are minimum temperatures changing and maximum temperatures changing. That's important, but we also wanted to understand things like, what about days when temperatures are below freezing, right? Like um, conditions below freezing are important for um, whether or not precipitation falls as rain or as snow. If it's above freezing, it'll rain. If it's below freezing, it snows, right? So this figure is showing the number of frost days, which are defined by uh, minimum temperatures. These would be nighttime temperatures that are below zero. And here we have our three regions, the western, the central, and the eastern, and these three areas of, our, um, of the northern forest. And all of these red lines are showing decreases over time in the number of days when temperatures are below zero. So you can see that you have this decline. And this map on the right is just showing what that looks like in space. So any of these dots that are red are also showing um, losses of frost days over a 100 year period. The bigger the dot, the greater the loss. Um, the smaller the dot, the smaller the loss. Areas that were in blue gain days. You see one blue dot, right? And then these little gray dots, there was no significant change. But overall, we're losing really cold conditions. We're losing these frost days. We also see decreases in snow cover, which makes sense. If it's not as cold, we're not going to get as much snow. So this set of graphs is set up in the same way where you have these trends here on the left. The top is showing the loss of the number of snow cover days. So that's any day where snow depth is above zero, right? So it could even be just a little bit of snow, right? But we're seeing a loss of snow cover days. And we're also seeing a loss of days where we can make snow. So ski areas have been trying to adapt to changing winters for a long time and they try to make artificial snow so that people can still go ski, but it has to be cold enough to be able to do that. Um, and so we're not just seeing a loss of snow cover, but we're also seeing the loss of days of opportunity to make artificial snow. And so again, um, these findings are summarized in a report that is available for a download. And I just want to share um, the high level findings. One, we're losing the cold, right? We're losing days below freezing and we're also having less frequent extreme cold days. We're losing snow. So we're losing days with snow cover and winters are shorter. So um, Nick alluded to this in the beginning, we have spring starting earlier um, and winter is ending earlier. So we're losing the sustained cold period, which is largely due to earlier spring. So that's what we see across the whole Northern forest region. 
I wanted to pull out um, some trends that were Maine specific because I know that some people are not calling in for Maine, but a lot of you are. Um, and so these are, um, this is a graph that came from the Maine Climate Council Scientific um, and Technical Subcommittee. So trying to understand climate change and its effects in Maine. Um, so this is showing um, uh, winter temperatures from 1890 to um, somewhere around 2015, 26, 18, yeah, 1895 to 2020. Sorry, that's the time series. Here, you have to be careful because the temperature is in Fahrenheit, not Celsius. So just a different um, measurement scale. And what we see is similar um, in the sense that we're seeing this overall warming pattern. We're seeing warmer temperatures. So loss of coldness, increase in warmness. And over this entire record, we're seeing an overall increase of five degrees Fahrenheit. These changes aren't even, they're not uniform. Um, so this is showing changes in snowfall um, for Maine. And here it's breaking Maine up into three divisions, coastal, central, and northern, and showing trends in snowfall for two different stations, for Caribou up north and for Portland in the south. For Caribou, we see an increase in snowfall over time. And for Portland, we see a decrease. And really this just has to do with um, differences in temperature between these two places. It's warmer here near the coast. And so any precipitation that we're getting is more likely to fall as rain. Even though we have an overall warming trend um, in winters, it's still cold enough in the North for it to continue snowing, right? So these changes aren't necessarily uniform um, across the entire region or within the state of Maine. So um, something that I am really interested in is how these long-term trends of winter warming, we know that it's getting warmer, we know we're overall getting less snow, but how do these long-term trends of winter warming collide with extreme weather events to create these really crazy weather situations? And I don't know if any of you remember this, but this is um, the Halloween snowstorm of 2011. Some people call it Snowtober. Um, this, was a, this, this was a nor'easter that came really early. So we had a very warm fall, it was very late um, fall, leaves were still on trees, and we had a very early season nor'easter, and those two things collided um, to result in um, millions of people out of power across the northeast, millions of dollars of damage, Halloween was canceled, um, and this to me is a classic example of an event that we call winter weather whiplash. And it sort of highlights the importance of understanding the difference between climate and weather, right? Because there is a difference between those two things. There's a great quote um, by Mark Twain, climate is what we expect, winter weather is what we get, right? And so what I mean by that is that Weather is the actual state of the atmosphere at a particular time and location. And climate is the statistical description of weather over a long period of time, usually 30 years or more. So even though climate overall is getting warmer, we still can have these extreme weather events that punctuate that overall warmer condition to result in these really sort of crazy um, uh, events. And we call these events winter weather whiplash. Um, and here's just a few pictures of what these events might look like, and I'm going to talk about them in a, in a minute. But our strict definition of winter weather whiplash is a class of extreme event. So it's an extreme weather event in which a collision of unexpected conditions, and you could think about um, a collision and whiplash like you might experience in your car. You, you have a forceful, rapid sort of back and forth change in winter weather, and this induces an outsized impact on people um, or on ecosystems or on both. And there's a few different types of winter weather whiplash events. You can have events that happen outside of winter, um, either during fall or spring. So you can have a fall spring where temperatures get really warm really early and that's followed by a frost. And so that can damage vegetation. It can um, result in um, huge impacts for, um, for agriculture. 
You can also have like in the snowtober example, a uh, um, late fall and then an early snowstorm. And if leaves are still on trees that can cause um, massive power outages as um, trees that are heavy with snow fall into power lines. You can also have events that happen within winter when we expect it to be cold, but it gets really, really warm. Um, you can have a rain on snow event um, where you have lots of rain falling on a heavy snowpack and getting massive flooding. Or you can have what we call a winter heat wave where it's super warm in the winter. Um, this picture in the bottom right is one of our local research sites near UNH. And this picture was taken in February of 2017. So this is not March or April when snow melt is happening. This is um, in uh, late February where it was 75 degrees outside. So we're interested in these events too because they have the potential to have these really big impacts. And we've done a little bit of research trying to understand what those impacts might be um, using Hubbard Brook as a case study. So Hubbard Brook, which I'm showing here in red, um, is a research site in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And they have a really long record of, of measuring temperature, snowfall, um, snow depth, stream flow, and lots of different aspects of the ecosystem. And um, what we did was we looked at, okay, what happens to just take stream flow? What happens to, um, uh, stream flow if you have uh, one of these winter weather whiplash events. And so what we see is that on average, if you have a winter heat wave, you have a really anomalously super warm winter day, you increase stream flow um, five times greater than what it would be otherwise, which has big implications for flooding, right? Um, that's just if you have a warm day. If you have rain on snow, so you don't just have warmth, but you also have rain, you can increase stream flow by an order of magnitude or at least 10 times greater than what it would be otherwise. And so again, you know, just emphasizing that at least in this one case study, you can have big impacts from these winter weather whiplash events um, here focused on hydrology and um, the, the flow of water. Both of these events um, are expected to increase in frequency in a warming climate. So both rain on snow and winter heat waves, these two different types of whiplash events. Again, you know, this is our research site, February 24th, 2017, where um, it should be really snowy and it's not. Um, here is just a picture of what um, the temperatures look like across the continental United States. And so, you know, this, 70 degree in orange. This is what we're getting in Durham, New Hampshire um, on that day. It was um, in the 60s in you know lots of Maine. And then right behind this warm front, you see this cold front, right? So it's super warm. And then we have cold air moving in, right? And so you can have also these sort of extreme back and forth fluctuations of cold to warm to cold to warm this yo-yo effect, this whiplash effect. And this um, is, uh, you know, what the question that's on my mind and on a lot of people's minds is, okay, so we see these trends toward warmer winters, towards winters that have less snow. We may have more of these whiplash events. Um, what, what's going to happen in the future, right? We know what things look like in the past. What might things look like in the future? This is a um, picture from the Boston Globe, again, um, that same February day in 2017 the warmest February day ever recorded in Boston. This woman is wearing shorts, buying hot dog. This is February, right? In some ways it's nice when those days happen, you know, like it feels good to go outside and get a break from the cold weather, but it also is sort of unsettling, at least to me. And so we have also spent some time trying to um, understand what winters will look like in the future, you know, particularly based on um, our understanding of what they've been like in the past. To do that, we have to use models. So I'm not a modeler. I work with modelers. Um, but basically what a model does is it takes um, the earth and breaks it up into a three-dimensional grid. 
And within each grid, it applies equations. And those equations are based on the laws of physics, chemistry of dynamics. And then it compares what happens within one grid to all of the neighboring grids around it, right? To try to simulate the climate system. And it's actually really complicated. It takes hundreds and hundreds of people to do this, to just, you know, get one climate model to work. Um, it takes atmospheric scientists, oceanographers, people like me who are more like ecologists, hydrologists, lots of engineers, so hundreds of people. But um, we do have um, some members of um, our research team who are climate modelers who can do some of this work. And so I'm just going to share um, some of what we found by using a group of models to try to understand what winters might look like in the future based on um, potential scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions. Because we know that it's our greenhouse gas emissions that are responsible for a lot of the warming that we're seeing, or for you know, almost all the warming that we're seeing. So I'm just gonna break this down. Um, the Paris Agreement, a lot of you may be, fam be familiar with. This is um, the agreement that um, nations have signed on to to try to limit warming to 2.8 degrees Fahrenheit. This would be to avoid the catastrophic effects of climate change. And this is what I'm showing here in green. Um, this is the, the even lower scenario, right? And it's often referred to as RCP 2.6. RCP stands for representative concentration pathway. So it's what is the potential concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere in the future based on decisions that we make, right? So the Paris Agreement is in green and this would have carbon emissions declining and um, temperatures that have been increasing starting to stabilize, right? So that's the Paris Agreement scenario. The lower scenario, which is above the even lower scenario, um, our CP 4.5 is here in blue. So we have atmospheric carbon emissions continue to increase and then they start to decline around 2050. And so again, you, you know, have some continued increase in temperatures, but they sort of level off. The highest scenario, which would be unmitigated warming is referred to as RCP 8.5, that's here in red. And this would be, you know, just continued business as usual emissions. And so then you would have runaway warming associated with that. Little quiz, right? So which scenario, scenario are we currently following? We're right now tracking the highest scenario. So um, we're not even in the lower scenario right now. Not that we, you know, can't get there, right? But currently, you know, we're, we're matching the highest scenario. And so just keep that in mind as I show you the next few slides about where our winters may be going, depending on these different scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so this figure is showing um, winters in the Northeastern United States starting in 1980 and going all the way out to 2100. This black line, these are observations. So these are measurements that we've made of actual temperature conditions. This light gray line, these are um, modeled historical observations or modeled historical um, values, right? So this is what the model said was happening in the historical period. And then this blue line is showing um, what a single model projects into the future, right? So this is what a single model said was happening historically. This is what a single model says is happening in the future, given a lower emissions scenario. But we don't just look at one model, right? Because no model is perfect. We look at what's called a model ensemble. So this is 29 different models. And here, you know, you see lots and lots of squiggles again. There's this black line showing observations. All of these gray lines are showing historical estimates of temperature. And then these blue lines are all 29 models projecting forward what temperatures will look like um, in the winter given this lower emission scenario. 
And this solid line in front is showing the ensemble mean, so the average of all of these models. And what it's saying is that um, by 2100, you're going to see an increase of 1.8 degrees Celsius of um, winter temperatures under this lower scenario. And I wanted to just point something out, which is that here, this is zero degrees Celsius. This is freezing, right? This is the threshold below which precipitation falls as snow and above which we get rain. And we cross that threshold according to these model simulations kind of around now, right? So it isn't just getting warmer, we're also losing frozen conditions that really affect um, how precipitation occurs, um, whether or not lakes freeze, right? So um, the freezing point of water is a really important physical threshold in nature. So that's with the lower emission scenario. With higher emissions, it's much worse. So this is the same figure. Um, here again, we're seeing the historical period, um, the observations in black, the historical estimates in gray, and then um, the uh, higher emission scenario in orange, you know, you, they, that overlaps the lower emission scenario for a time, and then they start to really diverge. So that by the end of the century, we see an increase in warming of about four degrees Celsius. Again, you know, just showing that we're losing um, temperatures that are below freezing. So it's getting a lot warmer, but we're also losing that sort of threshold below which water will freeze, that we'll get snow, keep snow, have ice on our ponds, et cetera. So that's temperature. But we also know that temperature affects snow. And so I'm gonna show you what um, the projections of snow look like across our region as well. This is a little bit of a different setup. So this is showing a map and this is showing the Northeastern United States and um, a part of Southern Canada. And this is showing um, the day of year that the snow disappears. So the snow melts um, across this domain from 1980 to 2005. So this is um, the historical period for which we have observations. Um, and areas that are in purple or dark blue, those have snow melt happening pretty early. Areas that are in green or in yellow, those have snow melt happening pretty late. Areas that are in gray don't have seasonal snow cover. So they don't have enough snow to really have a snow melt date per se. It might snow, but then it melts right away. And you wanna watch for that. So um, historically across the entire domain, snow melts April 13th, so the snow finally disappears in mid-April. Um, in Maine, you know, there are areas here, especially um, towards the west and the north that are somewhere in late April or even potentially May, early May. As we move forward, um, and look at the future projections. Um, this is looking at what it would look like at the end of the 21st century. So from 2070 to 2099. And um, under the lower climate scenario across the entire region, uh, snow melt and snow disappearance happens March 29th. So about two weeks earlier. Um, and let's see you start to see a lot of gray on this map, right? There's more gray creeping in. So you start to see more areas that are losing their seasonal snowpack. You're also seeing, you know, in Maine, more areas that are starting to look like they're melting out in March as compared to um, in April. And if you look at the higher emission scenario, it looks even more dire, right? So you see even more areas that are in gray and um, so this is showing that there's, you know, more of this um, part of the United States that no longer has snow at all, including where I live, right? I live in this little slice of New Hampshire down here. So I can go out and ski today, right? Because we had a nice snowstorm the other day. I couldn't do that necessarily in a hundred years very easily. You also see that um, 
you know, snow melt is happening, you see way, way, way more blue in this map, right? So snow melt is happening maybe in, um, in late February in some areas, um, in early March and others. And it's really only in the higher elevations that you have any snow even in April, right? So snow is disappearing a lot earlier, potentially in the future, um, given this um, higher emission scenario. And so just a few points I wanted to make. Um, so historically, we've lost 18 days of nighttime temperatures, cold temperatures below freezing. And we've lost 21 days of snow cover and that's across the whole Northern forest region. In the future, winters may feature fewer temperatures, well, will feature um, more temperatures above freezing and fewer snow cover days. We also may see more of these crazy extreme weather events where you have um, a collision of cold conditions with milder winters that produce winter weather whiplash. And this is a big deal, right? This loss of cold, this loss of snow, this winter weather whiplash can have consequences for ecosystems and for people. But I'm not gonna stop there because I feel like um, that's a really depressing place to stop a talk. And so I just wanted to um, highlight a few things that we can all do um, to try to make the future, um, you know, maybe look a little bit more like the green line on the graph, right? Maybe look a little bit more like the Paris Agreement where we avoid catastrophic warming, where we don't totally lose winter. So um, these are just six things that are not revolutionary, but I just wanted to share them. First thing is educate, right? And you're doing that now, right? Educate yourself about climate change so that you can educate others. There's some really amazing resources out there. This is a, um, a screen grab from uh, NASA's climate page um, where it has all kinds of information about the evidence for climate change, the causes, the effects, this, the consensus within the scientific community. Um, there's some really cool vital signs of the planet they have there. There's lots of resources out there. That's just one. Um, I gave a link to um, Catherine to put in the chat about that. So educate yourself so you can educate others. Um, number two, defend the science. So here's a great quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's an astrophysicist. Um, that says a skeptic will question claims that embrace the evidence. Um, a denier will question the claims then reject the evidence. And really what I'm getting at by this is that if you're trying to um, convince someone that climate change is real, focus on the skeptic, not on the denier, right? Um, a skeptic is someone who's persuadable with evidence. You may not be able to get the deniers and um, given limited time and energy, maybe you focus on the people who are persuadable. Uh, number three, use your voice. So speak up and get political. Vote, right? So this is a picture of Catherine Hayhoe. She's a climate scientist um, and an evangelical Christian. Um, she uh, works at Texas Tech and she does a lot of speaking about climate change. And this is just a great quote from her that I love, which is, a thermometer is not a Democrat or Republican, right? So um, climate doesn't have to be uh, uh, an issue that belongs to a single party, right? If you are passionate about changing the way that things are going, you know, talk to your representatives, talk to your senators, vote, right? Make it known that this is important to you no matter where you stand. I do a lot of talking to um, people trying to just get them to vote. Um, if they care about climate change, because um, a lot of people don't vote, right? Walk the walk, right? So reduce energy consumption, fuel consumption, carbon tax cap or tax yourself, um, support the low carbon economy, right? So walk the walk, um, set the example. This is my, one of my favorites, measure snow, right? So this may seem like not a big thing, but in the Eastern United States, we don't have a lot of snow measurements, not compared to the West. The West relies on snow for water and they have a huge infrastructure for measuring snow. 
in the east we don't really have that and so snow measurements are critical to try to understand how our winters are changing right we're losing snow and we don't have a ton of data to understand where and how fast that's happening so there's lots of ways you can do that you can be an observer through the coco ras program the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network, and you can go onto their website and look up information for how to do that. You need a ruler, right? You don't need really fancy equipment. You can also measure snow in the backcountry, so in areas that are harder to access. Um, this picture I've been showing is from the summit of Mount Chikora. Um, it could be, you know, not necessarily this remote, but just not necessarily in your backyard either. So measurements of snow in the backcountry can improve the way, ways that models predict and simulate snow depth um, by a lot, by as much as 90%, right? We don't know if the model is right unless we have something to compare it to. And there are no measurements in the Northeast really. And so, maybe one of you will be the first reporter for your region, right? So you can go to the Community Snow Ops page and learn more about how to do this. But really the sort of biggest thing that you can do is to talk about climate change. So again, this is Catherine Hayhoe. She is giving a TED talk about climate change, um, but it's important to talk to people about this, to connect on shared values and maybe it's skiing Maybe it's hunting, maybe it's snowmobiling, maybe it's maple sugaring. There's gotta be something, right? That you can connect with people about. Um, for me, it's, you know, a lot of things, but especially, you know, since I became a mom, it makes me feel almost nostalgic for a future that my kids or grandkids won't have, right? So that's how I connect a lot. Um, I want my kids and my grandkids and all the kids of tomorrow to know what it's like to have a snow day, to have school canceled and to go sledding and to have hot cocoa, right? I want that experience for them. And so that's how I try to connect. Um, that's all I've got to say for my talk. I just wanna say thank you to all the funders who made this possible. Thanks for your attention. Feel free to email me if you have questions, but um, I can also take questions now. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we do have some questions um, and I'm just going to go in order. Um, so Lynn had a question about total precipitation. Lynn, do you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. Well, I just thought when I saw that graph about um, uh, it was just snow precipitation precipitation changing over the years, how it compared to total precipitation changing over the years, over the same years, like overlaying the graphs. You mean when I was showing total snowfall? Right, right. Right, yeah. So that's actually a really important question because if total precipitation is increasing and in the southern part of the state, it's getting warmer, you're going to see less snowfall, right? But in the northern part of the state, you could see more snowfall because it's still cold. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And I had I had responded to one in the comments in uh, in Maine's Climate Future 2020. We really looked at so precipitation is increasing statewide in Maine, and we we really broke it down to look at extreme events, and so we're getting. It, it is raining more often um, and we're getting more rain. And so there's a shift from snow to rain up in the Southern Maine and the coast, especially, and we're getting more intense events. So um, we're getting more three inch rainstorms. And so three inches of rain in 24 hours or four inches of rain in 24 hours, we're getting more of those really big events, but the increase in precip is actually due to just more two inch storms and one inch storms. Um, so, you know, it's it's raining more often, we're getting more precip, but we're getting less snow at the same time. Um, so we had another question from Susan about deforestation. Susan, do you wanna ask your question? You asked it. Oh, no. 
Yeah, thanks, Ashley. <laughs> I'm not Susan, I'm with her though. Um, the question is, uh, do you know the relative impact that deforestation has or is having on um, CO2 levels? Yeah, it's a great question um, because deforestation is part of the emissions problem, right? Um, so you cut down trees and those trees stored carbon, right? It kept it out of the atmosphere. And what those, once those trees are cut, then the carbon that those trees stored gets re-released. It's hard to put an exact number on that for a lot of reasons because of what happens to the wood after it gets cut, right? So does it get burned right away? Does it get um, uh, made into lumber? Does it get made into biofuel, right? So what's the fate of it? And that varies a lot from place to place. So is it um, uh, wood that was cut in Canada versus wood that was cut in Brazil, right? So um, I don't have an exact number for that, but that's something that um, is contributing to the emissions. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Uh, another question about carbon sequestration and sort of any any links between um, sequestering carbon and winter warming. And that question was from Bob. It's nice to hear your voices. So like, have you ask your question and follow up. Hi there. This is uh, Bob and Linda. And um, I keep on reading about uh, carbon se sequestration. Um, and I'm not quite sure exactly what that is and how it works and if it affects the future of uh, winter warming. Yeah, so um, carbon sequestration is the idea that you could take some of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it. Um, and uh, you could store it in um, trees, right? So could you take areas that were deforested, where forests were cut down, and could you um, allow them to regrow, right? Um, could you plant forests in places that haven't had forests before? So those trees, as they grow, they, um, they do photosynthesis, right? So they make sugar by combining carbon dioxide and water. And in that process, they grow and they pull some of that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That's one way that you could sequester carbon. Um, you could also sequester carbon by trying to push it into soil. Um, and so you could do that. There's um, this idea that we have a, a soil carbon debt that we could repay. So, you know, 10,000 years of agriculture and, um, you know, at least for the last, um, hundred years of, you know, really intensively plowing the soil has depleted a lot of organic matter um, and a lot of topsoil, and that is rich in carbon. And so could you try to rebuild soil? And in, in that process, could you sequester carbon in soil? Um, those are just two examples, um, but that's um, something that's of really big interest to a lot of people. Um, not just because it's a potential pathway, you know, one of several that could help to stabilize the atmosphere. So there's this idea that there's no one way to try to stabilize emissions. There's lots of different items you could choose on the menu and that's one of them. Um, so, so there's a lot of interest in it for that reason, just from the standpoint of trying to stabilize um, greenhouse gas emissions and get the concentration of CO2 down. Um, it's also become um, uh, big money, right? Because you could trade carbon dioxide um, on the market, right? So people could buy and sell those credits. Um, I don't know if that's a helpful answer, but it's this idea that you can pull carbon out of the atmosphere and store it for some amount of time, at least long enough um, so that you could stabilize concentrations, concentration of carbon and start to sort of reverse the warming trend. Thank you for that information. Sure. Those were all the questions from the chat. Does anyone else have any questions for Alex? Okay. 
Alan. Right, Alan. Oh, okay. Oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. If you want to get a chance, no, no, no. Uh, I'd like to ask a question also. Great. We have more questions. Go, why don't uh, Bob? Why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Hi. Uh, we're we've been approved for the funding to do a forest management plan. Um, that'll probably get done in June, we hope. Um, the forest that we bought was last harvested in the 80s. And what we found out from the forestry uh, department, people that came out and looked at it was the less desirable trees were growing faster and shading out the uh, more desirable trees. And so, uh, the forest was not as healthy as it could be. So we were advised to do some select cutting. Now, if we're doing select cutting, are we deforesting it? Um, and is this something we can get built into our forest management plan? And the last question or last idea I'm, I'm trying to express is, now we have all these uh, limbs and smaller trees down uh, on the ground. Uh, is it best to uh, have that mulched so that it'll uh, you know, go back into the soil faster? Or what's the best way to handle that and deal with it? Yeah, so those are all good questions. I um, would say that doing a selective harvest thinning would not fit, at least in my mind, in the category of deforestation, right? That's forest management. Um, and I think that working with a forester to help you meet your goals is probably the best bet because I'm not one. So I don't know how to answer a lot of your questions. The wood part, um, what do you do with all that downed wood? You could mulch it. Um, that may not have the, you know, it depends on what you want, you know, um, that can, I only know this from experience uh, because of a, a large field experiment that we did at the uh, one of you and nature's properties where we did do a thinning and did mulch um, a lot of the down debris. And then what ended up happening was that it acted as mulch like what would happen in your garden and it trapped a lot of moisture. Um, and it also locked up a lot of nitrogen in the soil. Um, and so again, you know, I would really work with uh, a consulting forester to figure out what you want to do, but I wouldn't consider forest management to be deforestation, right? So sorry if I don't have a lot of information about that. Thank you very much. That's okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'd like to uh, just um, ask, a, ask a question because this seems to be one function and that function is co2 uh you know etc but what i've read about you know the earth's changing it's you know it's uh, tilt uh, there's so many things going on with that we've also had some of the biggest snowfalls ever in areas of four feet and etc um th th it seems that there's a lot of other things besides uh, the co2 that uh, is not been you know put together with all the other things and i think it's something like about 20 other functions that people have looked at and some of those functions you know see, you know um seem to be dependent upon a lot of things other than human beings yeah, so it's a great question. I had um, a nice infographic in the presentation that I took out for the sake of time that I can share the link to that sort of goes through um, some of the other um, questions and potential causes of climate variability over time. Things like um, the axial tilt of the earth, volcanic eruptions and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm happy to share the link. I'll find that. And it's uh, really neat. It sort of goes through the sort of additive contributions of all of those. Um, I showed, so regarding the carbon dioxide, I showed the Keeling curve that showed the increase in carbon dioxide 
um, because that is the most um, abundant greenhouse gas and responsible for most of the warming that we're seeing. There are other greenhouse gases that are contributing to that warming. Um, and so you're right, it's not just about carbon dioxide. Um, but, you know, you can put together all of the other potential factors um, like volcanoes, like um, natural climate variability that comes from changes in the axial tilt of the earth, and you still don't add up to the warming that we're seeing. Um, one of the things that modelers do is that they will run models that include people and that don't include people, right? And if you um, don't include people, then you don't see the temperature increases that we're seeing. Um, and uh, so I think that's interesting, right? Without us, you don't get the warming trends. The thing about the extreme snowfalls, and you're right, we are getting some really big ones. Um, that has um, partly to do with the fact that there's a lot more moisture in the atmosphere. So um, as Catherine was saying, you know, in Maine, as in other places, we're getting more extreme precipitation events where we get a lot of precipitation all at once instead of spread out. Um, we expect to see the same thing for snow, where instead of getting many small snowstorms, we get fewer huge snowstorms. Um, and I guess I would also emphasize that um, weather and climate are two different things. Like I was saying, climate is something that unfolds over a really long period of time. And weather is something that happens over um, you know, a matter of days. And so you can have a weather event that ha includes a big snowfall or a really big cold snap. And that doesn't mean that climate change isn't happening. Um, one way that I think about this is um, I have a dog, I take my dog for walks in the woods and he's off leash. I'm walking down the trail, I'm going in a straight line. My dog is zigzagging all over the trail, right? He's chasing squirrels, he's chasing sticks. Um, the trail is the trend, the overall increase in warming. The dog is the variability around that trend. Sometimes it's colder, sometimes it's warmer. That doesn't mean that we're not walking on the trail, right? It doesn't mean that we're not following a trajectory. And so um, definitely, you know, it's okay to be skeptical. Um, and I will share with um, Catherine that link to uh, the, the article I mentioned that sort of goes through a lot of those causes. But, um, but yeah, I think there's um, ample evidence that the climate is warming and that it's caused by us. Yeah, the, uh, the Maine's Climate Future Report that I put a link to also discusses things like volcanoes and El Nino and La Nina um, and, and um, has some of the same information that Alex just. Um, yes, it does, Nick, yeah. Um, Nick, do you, you had a question? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think it was answered. I'm all set, thanks. Okay. Um, anyone else have a question? We have time for just one or one or two more. Um, hi, it's Jefferson Savengstuk. Um, quick question. I I don't fully understand how in the in the map of um, snowfall change in Maine with the uh, uh, decrease in snowfall um, on the coast. I mean, I I think I I get, but I don't understand how the the northern part of Maine increased. Right. Would it be helpful right. if be I helpful. pulled that up again? Thank you. I can I can do that. Here, I'm gonna. Well, you have to just watch me go through all my stuff. Because I'm gonna have to unshare my screen and reshare it, and anything could happen. Okay. Here we go. Um, so here's that graphic again, and here's Maine. It's got these three climate zones: coastal, central, and northern. And um, the, one of the key things to see here is that um, these are different colors. So the northern part is more blue. And so these would be, you know, maximum temperatures during the winter in December, January, and February. And these would be maximum daytime temperatures. So it could get colder if it's nighttime. Um, and this northern tier is mostly blue, right? So you, it's cold here. 
the southern part of Maine, you have a lot more light green and dark green, so it's warmer, right? So you have two different temperature conditions. But across this area, right, that has two different temperature conditions, you're getting the same amount of precipitation. But that precipitation is going to fall two different ways, depending on where it is, right? If it's in the south, where it's warm, that precipitation is going to fall as rain because it's not cold enough for it to snow. And so because that precipitation is falling as rain, you're going to see a decline in snowfall over time. In the north, that precipitation is going to be falling as snow. And so you might see this increase in snowfall over time, not just because it's cold here, but because overall we have more moisture in the atmosphere. We have more precipitation in general, right? So um, this isn't showing total precipitation, right? It's not showing how much total, it's just showing how much of that falls as a solid, as snowfall, as opposed to a liquid as rain. Does that make sense? Um, no. <laughs> I guess I, I, well, I don't understand like why, why is it increasing as opposed to staying the same, I guess. <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead, Catherine, maybe you, no, you try. <laughs> so, so the coast has warmed more. If you look at winter warming, um, the winter is, it's, it's warmed faster on the coast than it has in Northern Maine. So the, these are like official climate divisions and you can see why um, uh, the state is divided that way. And it's almost as if the sort of they're getting farther apart. Um, so because we're getting more precipitation but it's still cold enough in Northern Maine, they're getting more snow. Um, whereas uh, in a coast snowfall has decreased but overall precipitation has increased. So everybody's getting more precipitation um, and more of it's falling as snow in the north and more of it's falling as rain and thus less snow on the coast. Got it, thanks. One, Thank one other question, one other question yeah. that always, uh, you know, got, got my mind thinking about uh, these things is most of the storms that produce snow are farther east or east from us, you know, as the, the, the counterclockwise, et cetera, you get mm -hmm. more snow, of course, when the storm is out. Most of the storms that I've looked at over the years that go to the West produce no snow in, in you know, here. So is that also taking uh, a situation uh, away from what is causing the storms to go in away from things? Uh, or is it just uh, by, you know, a different reason? But you mean the, the trajectory of storms? Yeah, exactly. In other words, you get a storm, uh, you know, the right distance from the coast, all of a sudden the, the storms, you know, are tremendous. I mean, I measured the storm in Maine, uh, in where we are, Winter Harbor, about seven years ago when we had 152 inches of snow that, hmm. that year. Um, and again, it was all the storms hitting exactly the same area. And I wondered if, again, these are things that we're look, not looking at in, in, in that area because there are so many other ways of looking at it. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the big storms, this is a little outside of my area, um, but my understanding is that one of the drivers is that there is so much more moisture in the atmosphere. And, you know, the nor'easter, the classic nor'easter, you're getting that moisture coming up from the tropics and it's meeting the cold air that's coming down from the Arctic. And um, if you have more moisture in the atmosphere because it's warmer, right? The, the planet is warmer. And that because it's warmer, it's evaporating more water off the oceans, right? It's just the atmosphere is carrying a lot more water. Um, you can have a situation where you just have huge storms bigger than what you've had historically, just because there's 
more water in the atmosphere to, to create these big snowfalls. Again, this is not my area of expertise, so I couldn't really say, um, but that's, that's my understanding of why we might be getting some of these huge snowstorms. Thanks for these questions. Any, anyone we haven't heard from have a question? Alex, is it okay? I'm going to share my screen just yeah. for some wrap up. Yep. Um, thank you so much, Alex. Um, that was really helpful and certainly very timely. Um, I just wanted to um, make sure that um, that everyone knew um, that we have a lot more happening with the Winter Festival this weekend. Unfortunately, a lot of the in-person events um, like Sandy's Walk um, are, have filled up because we had to really limit um, the number because of COVID-19 precautions. But we do have some more online events and so please do um, check it out. And um, I just want to make sure that we thank our sponsors for the Winter Festival, um, which are listed here, Bar Harbor Bank and Trust, especially, and Lionham Insurance, Winter Harbor, Scudic Insurance, and Brown Homes and Millican. Um, we're um, always taking suggestions. So if you have ideas for things you'd like to see either next year at the Winter Festival or talks for the upcoming season, um, please do share those with us. Um, and if you're interested in climate change and you want more science, um, the next session of the Acadia National Park Science Symposium is coming up in a few weeks. And we're gonna be talking, talking about um, not just how things are changing, but what can we do about it and how our um, park managers and other conservation practitioners um, taking steps to adapt to these changes that we're confronting. And we also have some previous sessions that have been recorded so you can catch up on those if you want to. Um, thank you all so much for spending your evening with us. Really appreciate it. And thanks especially to Alex. Um, great talks, really um, great information. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Great talk, thank you. And I hope you get out to ski sometime this weekend, this winter, Alex. I hope so too. And Nick, we do have snow up here in Bangor. So if you want to come ski, get up here quickly. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Catherine. Yes, that's a good idea. Thanks, everybody.